Hello, and welcome to A Shadow of Divine Perfection, Art of the Italian Renaissance and Baroque. My name is Dr. Katie Clark, and on behalf of the patrons of the arts in the Vatican Museums, a very warm welcome to all of the patrons joining us today, as well as our friends and guests. Thank you for being with us. Today's lecture, Saints, Symbols, and Spaghetti, is the second of this seven-part series. If you would like to rewatch any part of today's talk or see any of the previous lectures in this or other series, you can always visit californiapatrons.org slash lecture dash series, as well as our YouTube channel or our Facebook page. We'll show those links again at the end of today's talk. This lecture series is underwritten and presented by the California and Northwest chapters of the patrons. As a nonprofit organization, the patrons of the arts work to preserve, protect, and restore the vast and unique treasures housed in the Vatican Museums in Rome. Patrons have special access to the Vatican Museums when they are in Rome, including special tours of the Restoration Labs, the Sistine Chapel, and other rarely seen areas. We also meet regularly in local chapters throughout the year for behind the scene tours and exhibitions of fine arts in our region. If you are a patron, thank you for your support. If you're considering joining, we would love to have you as part of our community. Please head to any of these websites for more information. Since we're pleased to welcome nearly 900 people to today's talk, your sound and video will be turned off throughout. During the lecture, you can always enter any questions you have for Rocky or any technical issues into the Q&A box you see at the top or bottom of your screen. If you have any problems with your video or sound, one of our producers will assist you. We'll answer as many questions as we can live during our question and answer period at the end of this talk. If you'll enter your name along with your question, we can also make sure that you receive an email response to any that we don't have a chance to get to on the air. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Rocky Ruggiero. Rocky Ruggiero is a professor of art and architectural history. He lectures for various American universities in Florence and has appeared in a number of TV documentaries concerning the Italian Renaissance, including those on the History Channel, NBC, and PBS. After living in Florence for nearly 20 years, Rocky now divides his time between the US and Italy, offering specialized lectures on art and architectural history, educational seminars on topics ranging from ancient art and architecture through the Italian Baroque, and cultural events throughout the country. In Italy, Rocky leads private excursions and adult programs in Florence, Rome, Venice, Siena, and Northern Italy. And as many of our patrons can tell you, he is a regular guide and a tremendous favorite of our chapters when we visit Italy. Please welcome Dr. Rocky Ruggiero. Grazie, Katie. Grazie, grazie for that fabulous introduction. Uh, buongiorno or buonasera, depending on what part of the world you are in. Uh, this is my second time here with the patrons of the arts in the Vatican Museums, uh, California and Northwest chapters, and I'd like to give a special grazie uh, to these organizations uh, for having me, uh, and probably more importantly for what it is that you do uh, for the very substance of my profession. I live, I breathe uh, the art and the architecture of Italy, and in particular, obviously, of the Vatican, so I just find it of paramount importance, of course, that organizations like yours, in fact, find it the time uh, and the resources to maintain such an important patrimony. Now, today I'm coming at you with a rather particular theme, and you see the name here, uh, which is the Saints, Symbols, and Spaghetti. And in fact, the idea behind this lecture was that I was trying to explain to my undergraduate students how uh, essentially, when they're watching movies or reading comic books, that they are able to recognize certain superheroes because of certain attributes. Whether it's Spidey over there on the left-hand side, the web slinger, whether it's the man of steel in the center, or whether it's Cap uh, with his shield. And in very much the same way, they can also recognize the medieval and Renaissance superheroes in art. And my goal in teaching them the attributes of these different saints. Now, I'm simplifying it, of course, my undergraduate students, and I'm simplifying it for you. But in reality, what it is I'm talking about is hagiographic hey iconography. But try feeding hagiographic hey iconography to a bunch of 20-year-olds. Huh? In other words, what I'm doing is increasing their visual literacy. 
so that when they're looking at medieval and Renaissance and Baroque art in Italy and in Europe in general, they're able to appreciate, they're able to understand. It's important to understand exactly who these characters are uh, in order to appreciate the art in which they appear. So this notion of increasing people's visual literacy. And of course, these saints also had their attributes. Sometimes they were superpowers, uh, sometimes they were not. So what I thought I would do is sort of go through a survey of the more popular of these saints uh, and just exactly why certain symbols are associated with them. And so we begin with Saint Joseph, right? The foster father of Jesus Christ, the husband of the Virgin Mary. And few people realize that St. Joseph's defining attribute is this flowering stick that he's holding here in his right hand. And even if you are familiar, <clears throat> excuse me, with this particular symbol, I'm not sure many people actually realize why. So let's go all the way back to the beginning of the 14th century and to my absolute favorite monument in the world, which is the Scrovegni Chapel in the Italian city of Padua, to actually see the story of this flowering rod of Joseph. And Giotto recounts it better than any other artist. The story goes that when the Virgin Mary came of marrying age, all of the young men in Nazareth desired her hand in marriage. But the Virgin Mary was so beautiful and so virtuous, the question is which one of these uh, young men was deserved of her. So the story is that the priests at the temple got involved and decided that the Almighty himself would decide who the Virgin Mary's husband would be. So they invited all potential suitors to temple and asked them to present a rod, R-O-D, or a stick. These rods would be collected. These rods would be blessed. And then whichever of the rods distinguished itself from the others, the bearer of that particular rod was in fact the man chosen by God to win the hand of the Virgin Mary. That is the scene that you see here depicted by Jolta, the presentation of the rods. And as the story goes, there was a gentleman in Nazareth who was much older than the Virgin Mary and therefore much older than the other suitors as well, whose name was Joseph. And the genius of Giotto, the painter, is to show Joseph back here. We know he's older than everyone else because he has that kind of George Clooney salt and pepper thing going there as well. And he was a little embarrassed to participate in this competition because of his age. So while all of these younger men with their full heads of brown hair are presenting their rods, the story goes that Joseph kind of hesitantly remained in the back of the temple. And in the next scene, painted by Giotto, so I'm going through the sequence here, which is called the watching of the rods, in which essentially nothing is happening. And I find this absolutely extraordinary that a 14th century painter would waste an entire wall space to simply build suspense. And so you see the rods have been piled up. Here are the priests down in the trenches with all of the other hopefuls, looking up, waiting for something to happen. And you can see Joseph back here amongst them as well, watching, waiting for some divine sign to occur. Well, the story goes that in the end, Joseph did not present his rod. He remained at the back of the temple with his rod in hand, when suddenly it burst forth into bloom. A flower popped out of the top of Joseph's rod. A dove descended from the sky and landed upon it. And everyone realized, of course, that he was the man chosen by God to marry the Virgin Mary. And so this is the marriage of the Virgin. I'm not kidding. This is the story of the marriage of the Virgin as recounted in the 13th century apocryphal text known as the Golden Legend. My favorite part of how Giotto visualizes this is the protest. Look at this gentleman back here who's crying foul. He says, I want to take a look at that rod. I think there's something amiss. Look at this gentleman who's actually breaking his rod on his knee. And you can interpret that however you like. Right? But consider that this kind of burlesque humor was not lost on a 14th century audience because it was this particular subject that actually compelled one of Giotto's students, a painter named Taddeo Gaddi, painting on the walls of Santa Croce in Florence. The exact same scene. Here is Joseph with that magic rod, putting a wedding ring onto the hand of the Virgin Mary. Here's the gentleman breaking his stick. Here's the gentleman crying foul but perhaps the most humorous figure that you will see in the entire history of art is this young lad who's appeared at the competition with nothing less than a sapling upon his shoulder. And clearly the message is, it is not the size of the rod that matters. It is instead its magical powers. 
find that extraordinary that 700 years ago, uh, they could make jokes that are still very much uh, relevant and resonant with us today. Right? Okay, let us move on now to another perhaps more familiar saint to all of you, considering, of course, your dedication to the art uh, in the Vatican, which is such an extraordinary collection. And many of you know, of course, that this painting by Perugino, which is located in the Sistine Chapel. Tradition maintains, in fact, that it was the cardinal who was assigned to sleep underneath Perugino's delivery of the keys, who would eventually become Pope, sort of the good luck fresco inside of the chapel. And in this image, here is Jesus, and as tradition maintains, giving the keys, he says to Simon, you are Petrus, you are my rock upon which I shall build my church. And so Peter receives these keys. And so easy to identify St. Peter because he's almost always shown holding a set of keys, one of which is golden, the other instead silver. Right? And that is, you see the logo, right? Obviously of the patron of the arts, the intersecting keys coming from this particular tradition. But there's also another way to identify St. Peter. And it has to do with his method of execution. Because according to legend, when Peter was about to be crucified under orders by Emperor Nero, he specifically requested to be crucified upside down. That he did not deem himself to be worthy to be crucified in the same manner of Jesus Christ. And so in fact, he was crucified in this particular way. No satanic overtones. Uh, if you're wondering, because oftentimes people see the upside down cross and they know there's some kind of satanic message, none there at all. It is simply the way that Peter was crucified according to tradition. And my favorite pictorial version of the subject is Caravaggio's crucifixion of St. Peter, which is in the church of Santa Maria del Popolo in Rome. And Caravaggio at the beginning of the 17th century, we'll be talking much about him in one of my upcoming lectures here. Uh, I just adore the artist and I adore this, this earthquake that he represents at the beginning of the 17th century, uh, where his art was so realistic, was so up close. Uh, what one uh, contemporary artist actually described as this sort of living theater. I mean, this looks like something that's actually taking place in front of you with these characters. It's almost like realism in film. These are not actors. These are real people that Caravaggio has incorporated into the scene. And it makes that symbolism of the upside down crucifixion even more meaningful when it becomes a human drama. All right, All right let's move on. To a follower of Caravaggio, a Spanish saint by the name of Giuseppe Ribera, who actually spent a large part of his career in Naples in Italy. And here he's painting a figure that may remind you of the St. Peter that I showed you a minute ago. Uh, this is a painting in the Pitti Palace. Uh, and this tenebrism, this light, dark contrast that kind of typifies this style makes it a little hard to read. But can you notice that sort of ripe skin on the body of this figure? Right? Because if you don't know, St. Bartholomew, the apostle St. Bartholomew, was martyred by being skinned alive. And so the idea that this ripe skin suggests what it is that is about to happen, which does not prevent other artists from actually showing St. Bartholomew after the fact. And I, ad I adore this figure on the outside of Milan Cathedral because you see people just casually walking by, not even noticing that there is in fact a representation of St. Bartholomew standing outside the church with no epidermis, with no skin actually covering his body. Again, referring to his particular means of martyrdom, which was rather gruesome. And not surprisingly, considering again how St. Bartholomew was killed, it seems that he developed an acute case of acmophobia or fear of knives. And you see this sometimes exploited by other artists. Here we are in Florence in the uh, convent, the nunnery of Santa Apollonia, where Andrea del Castaño painted the celebrated uh, Last Supper. And if you look right over here, right, here's a detail of St. Andrew sitting next to St. Bartholomew. And Andrew has that large knife in his hand. And look at that expression of concern on Bartholomew's face, because it's a foreshadowing of how he will meet his end. And the nuns who dined in this room uh, would appreciate, of course, this kind of nuance, this foreshadowing clue uh, upon which they could pick up and understand what was happening. This is not the only time you actually see Bartholomew looking quite scared when there are knives around him. All right. Okay, we keep going. 
another of Christ's apostles, who is usually quite easy to recognize. Uh, and he, of course, is St. Thomas. Uh, this is the celebrated bronze statue by Andrea del Verrocchio, who was Leonardo da Vinci's uh, teacher. This statue was recently in Paris for that big Leonardo blockbuster show, celebrating the 500th uh, anniversary of Leonardo's death. And of course, the image is of Thomas, who was the apostle not present when Christ first appeared to the apostles, saying, look, I don't believe he's alive and kicking again, and I won't believe it until I can actually probe his wound with my hands. And so here's the image of Christ inviting Thomas to actually insert those fingers. So what is Thomas's attribute? It's that finger that was looking for proof physically uh, in the body of Jesus Christ. And here Verrocchio is very uh, ornamentational, beautiful, uh, romanticized interpretation. Uh, but then, of course, leave it to Caravaggio to give us the rather graphic interpretation of the scene uh, where Christ quite gingerly uh, leads uh, Thomas's finger into that wound. No one else but Caravaggio could have painted this and actually pulled it off. And it's so disturbing that Thomas himself is not watching that finger as it disappears, but the other apostles are instead. So it is the finger that becomes the defining attribute. Call it a superpower, if you will, of St. Thomas. And in fact, if you were standing in the Dominican uh, refectory of Santa Maria delle Grazie, looking at Leonardo da Vinci's famous Last Supper painting and trying to figure out just exactly who the apostles are, well, you'd immediately recognize that there's an apostle back there pointing up with his right hand and say, ah, it's St. Thomas, because Leonardo knew, like others, that that was his defining attribute. Right? So that magic finger becomes the attribute of St. Thomas. Okay, let's apply your knowledge even further. Right? Let us say that you are in Florence, God willing. Again, if you don't know, I've not been in Florence now for some almost six months, and I'm beginning to go a little stir crazy here. Um, I'm usually dividing my time about six months in the US and six, six months in Italy, but this year is particularly difficult, as most of you know. But let us pretend that we are in Florence and we hike all the way up to that Romanesque church of San Mignato al Monte, and we walk inside and we're looking up at the mosaic that adorns the apse of the church where we have this large figure of Jesus Christ. Now, people say, how do we know that this is Jesus Christ? And the answer is very simple, because this figure looks Jesus-y. And to look at Jesus-y may sound facetious, but what I'm really saying is iconography. Jesus always looks the same. And the subject matter has a tendency to be the same. So after a while, you just get used to recognizing these characters like we do, uh, for instance, with superheroes. And if that's not enough, how about the Greek letters of Alpha and Omega? Christ said that he was the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, and there they are. Under Jesus's right arm, we have a woman. And remember, nine times out of 10, if there is a woman in medieval and uh, Renaissance Christian art, uh, there is a high probability that is the Virgin Mary. And in fact, this is the case here. You see the SM, right? Santa Maria. And then to the other side, we have this young man holding a crown. And consider that the crown is the symbol of martyrdom. If you died for your religion, if you died for your faith in Christianity, you were promised instant salvation. You entered into the kingdom of heaven, hence the crown that you see there. And the saint is identified as San Miniatus Rex Ermine, or Saint Minius, the titular saint of the church. And he was an Armenian king, handing his crown to Jesus. But then you notice these four figures here. Right. There is an eagle by Jesus' right knee, who is identified as San Johannes, or St. John. There is a winged lion, San Marcus, or St. Mark. You have an angel, looks like he's sneaking out from behind the throne. That is San Mateus, or St. Matthew. And then finally, the winged ox, who represents St. Luke. So the four evangelists, the authors of the New Testament Gospels, in Byzantine art, usually represented by their symbols. Uh, as opposed to their personas. You don't see them, you see symbols of them instead. And this is important because when looking at art, again, produced in Europe at that time, if you see an evangelist associated with an angel, you know that it is Saint Matthew as represented here by Caravaggio in the church of San Luigi dei Francesi. Why an angel? 
because according to tradition, the angel actually dictated the gospel to an illiterate Saint Matthew. So you see him looking up attentively as the angel is ticking off. You remember the beginning of the gospel of Matthew is quite tedious. It is the generations of Jesus Christ. So-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so going all the way back into the Old Testament. And consider that this is actually the second version of the subject that Caravaggio painted, because the first, which is now lost, it was destroyed in the bombing of Berlin in 1945, made St. Matthew look so unintelligent in a very unflattering way that the patrons of the chapel said, "Uh uh-uh, can't take that. And so they asked Caravaggio for a second version instead, which is the one that I just showed you. Or you see an image of a man at a lectern with a book, and here, almost like a dog or a pet, uh, uh, kind of sitting behind the lectern is the ox, and you know that you're looking at St. Luke. So using these symbols to represent the evangelists. If any of you have been to, if any of you are going to Venice anytime soon, you know, of course, that the winged lion here on the Porta della Carta, uh, bridging between the Basilica of St. Mark's and the Doge's Palace on the right-hand side, is ubiquitous throughout the city because St. Mark the Evangelist, A, is allegedly entombed in the church next door, and B, is the patron saint of that city. So why the wing lion? Because St. Mark is the saint to whom the city of Venice is dedicated. Uh, And then finally, St. John the Evangelist, who appears here in a fresco by Correggio, uh, the great Northern Italian painter, Uh, represented by an eagle instead. So these are the symbols of the four evangelists. And you see, I'm uh, uh, focusing on the celebrity saints, if you will, right? The sort of A-list. And in fact, if we're talking about A-list saints, um, St. John the Baptist is way up there uh, in terms of hierarchy. Uh, This is one of my favorite representations of St. John. It is in Venice, it's in the Church of the Frari. Uh, And St. John, of course, was the voice crying out in the wilderness, uh, living on that very special diet of locusts and wild honey. So if you're looking for another dieting idea, it worked really well for St. John. It also worked for another saint, who I'll show you in just a sec. And St. John always looks a little dazed and confused. He has that kind of Cheech Marin look going, the long straggly hair because he doesn't shower very much. And according to the description, of course, the camel hair shirt that he wore, which in the Renaissance is transformed into the sort of animal skin instead. So very easy. And of course, he's an ascetic. He's emaciated. He's worn down. He looks wild in his spirituality. Notice the scroll that John holds right, with the words usually ecce agnus dei, behold the Lamb of God. And what he's missing, but once held in his right hand, is a long reed cross, another defining attribute of SJB, as I like to call him. That is the reed cross that he normally holds, which in this case was lost because the sculpture is six centuries old, and at some point uh, a piece went missing. Right. Here is Brad Pitt in the role of St. John the Baptist, if you get my drift. So again, it's like watching, I don't know, different directors direct Batman movies. And Batman looks really old fashioned in one. He looks really high tech in the other because different artists will have different approaches to the same subject. And Lorenzo Ghiberti, who most of you know as the artist who made those beautiful golden doors on Florence Baptistry, saw John as this beautiful figure with this perfect hair day, with this exaggerated uh, or exaggeratedly curved body. Uh, What is, in fact, the animal skin is usually misinterpreted as chest hair on this particular statue in Or San Michele, which I find absolutely amusing. And there's that cross that was missing in the uh, Donatello version, but you see here instead. So again, remember, different artists will represent the same saint using the same attributes, but the overall effect might be very different. My personal favorite representation of St. John the Baptist appears up here on the dome of Florence Baptistry. Okay, so these early 13th century mosaics, you have this giant 21 foot tall figure of Jesus Christ. And just to the right hand side of Jesus, you have this figure, here's a detail, of a very Jerry Garcia-ish looking figure of SJB. I just find this particular 
of course, is that when you look at the stuff as much as I do, uh, you become <laughs> almost attached to certain interpretations, like movies, like versions of a song or what have you, because again, these saints were nothing less than superheroes in the Middle Ages. Now, St. John the Baptist, the ascetic, the voice crying out in the wilderness, the madman, who oftentimes has a female saint, or I should say, has a version of a female saint associated with him. Right? And that female saint is Mary Magdalene. And this is one of the most powerful sculptures, I believe, in the history of art. This is Donatello interpreting a different version of Mary Magdalene, because most of the time, the, uh, Mary Magdalene looks like a voluptuous, <clears throat> beautiful, beautifully dressed female figure, because according to tradition, she was a prostitute. So her beauty uh, was essentially associated with her sort of persona. Uh, but there is a medieval tradition. And in fact, consider that many of these saints are described very fleetingly, very superficially in the Bible. And of course, a medieval and Renaissance audience wanted to know more. Uh, where did they go to school? Did they get good grades? Uh, did they go to the prom? And so what happens, of course, is lots of oral tradition uh, became written tradition. And this book that I uh, mentioned earlier called The Golden Legend. So if you want to know where to go to find out about these saints and their stories, well, you go to this book. It's readily available uh, in English called The Golden Legend, written by an Italian in 1265, uh, named Jacopo de Voragine, and you will find these different stories. And the story of the Virgin Mary, Virgin Mary, <laughs> Freudian slip, the story of Mary Magdalene is that she left the Holy Land with her sister Martha and their brother Lazarus. And if you're at home saying, hold on a minute, I didn't realize that Mary Magdalene was the sister of Martha and Lazarus, that's because she's not. And so these stories would often kind of, kind of just group together saints or superimpose them uh, for convenience sake. So one story kind of tells the story of two different Marys. And that she moved to the hills up in the area of southern France called Provence. And she decided to try the St. John the Baptist diet of the locust and wild honey thing. And that as her clothes eventually just uh, worn down to, to tatters, her hair became her only means of clothing. And what more successful representation of asceticism have you ever seen than here in Donatello's? Uh, there's more skull than there is face, uh, two teeth left dangling in her mouth, the trachea uh, visible through the skin, the collarbones protruding, and that false sense of volume given by the hair then betrayed. Look at these toothpick legs that come out from down below. You get a sense of just how frail a figure she actually is. So this is a different version of Mary Magdalene, a far cry from the more traditional one that we are used to seeing, and that is this beautiful image of Mary Magdalene uh, as this sort of uh, distressed prostitute. But then, of course, there are certain geniuses in the history of art who combine versions, and that's exactly what Titian does here in what I like to describe as nothing less than a conditioner commercial. <laughs> uh, this is, you know, again, Tiziano, Titian, the great Venetian master who actually signs this painting. You see the anointing jar, which in fact is Mary Magdalene's traditional attribute. She was the uh, person who went to the tomb on Sunday morning to anoint the body. Saturday was the Sabbath. She couldn't. She waited till Sunday morning only to find the tomb empty. And so what Titian has done, Titian famous for celebrating these uh, famous courtesans uh, who lived and worked in the city of Venice and using them as his models. And so here, there is this sort of intellectual pun because this is a courtesan, this is a prostitute, playing the role of a prostitute, but playing the penitent role. So that her hair, which is not that straggly mess that we saw just a minute ago, but instead this incredibly lush, um, healthy, vibrant hair covering a body, which again in the 16th century would have been considered sort of pinup uh, material, if you will. So you see that, that kind of reverence and solemnity that may have characterized medieval representation of saints um, is becoming much, much less uh, serious, much more loose, if you will, uh, of, particularly when the Venetians who were celebrated for their erotic art. In fact, we were joking about this before we came on air. Next week, I'm talking about the Renaissance pleasure palaces. Um, and believe it or not, you know, I, I kind of warned it, that it's gonna be a very spicy lecture next week, very steamy uh, lecture, because there's quite a bit of erotic art that's being produced as well. And oftentimes, believe it or not, the protagonists also happen to be holy figures. But 
I'll save that for next week. So make sure you come back uh, to hear more. Okay, you see this painting of a saint, clearly, because he has a halo around his head, but he sort of looks like a musketeer, right? What are these two protrusion things? They look like potatoes or what have you. Well, this is Saint Stephen or Santo Stefano. And those things on his head are rocks or stones. Now, why does he have rocks or stones on his head? Well, because Saint Stephen was martyred, as you see here in this representation by Fra Angelico, by being stoned to death. All right. Now, to be perfectly honest, I can no longer use the gerund stoned when describing his martyrdom to my undergraduate students. Because when I tell my undergraduates that St. Stephen was stoned to death, they look at me and they say, cool. Okay. Uh, so now instead I've changed that to lapidated. He was lapidated. They threw stones at him until he died. And so technically speaking, those two protrusions that you just saw a minute ago uh, were in fact the stones used to kill St. Stephen. All right? So stones are associated with St. Stephen. Here, you walk into the old sacristy in the church of San Lorenzo in Florence, and you see these um, terracotta statues by Donatello. If you look at this saint, you know he's a saint, he has a halo. There is a stone stuck to his head, and you say, oh, that must be Saint Stephen. But here, Saint Stephen has a friend. And his friend, who, by the way, looks like he's holding a uh, writing instrument there, a feather, but in reality, that is a palm. And so I told you the crown is the symbol of martyrdom. Well, so too is the palm. Because remember, they wove palms when Christ entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday to welcome him as a king. And so the palm is also a symbol of royalty. This is the idea. And so when you see a saint holding a palm, it's also indicative that that saint is also a martyr. Now, what is this object? that the saint is holding in his right hand. You see the name there is St. Lawrence. Some people think it's a ladder. Some people think it's a window frame. But in reality, that object that he's holding in his hand is a grid iron, or in modern colloquial terms, a barbecue grill. Because St. Lawrence was martyred by being burned alive. I mean, this famous representation in his namesake church, the church of San Lorenzo in Florence, of the martyrdom of St. Lawrence, where you see him here in the center of the painting, up on his gridiron, and it looks like he has something to say, because tradition maintains that about halfway through his martyrdom, St. Lawrence actually sat up and uh, informed his executioner that he should turn him over because he was done cooking on that particular site. I'm not kidding. This is the official version of the story. But for this reason, right, St. Lawrence is considered to be the patron saint of chefs and cooks. I kid you not. And in fact, the title of this lecture, the saints, the symbols, and the spaghetti. Well, consider that St. Joseph, all the way back to the beginning of this lecture, who is the patron saint of workers, because Joseph was a carpenter. And there's a, uh, an Italian recipe of spaghetti with breadcrumbs, toasted breadcrumbs put over the top. It's the piatto povero. It's the poor dish for working class people. It's a double dose of carbs, right? It would never go over uh, in modern society, but that was essentially the idea. Or that St. Lawrence was also the patron saint of cooks and shelf. And so much of this hagiography is in fact associated with the culinary arts. I'm not pulling it out of the left field uh, in, in my particular uh, uh, entitling of this lecture. And I'm gonna give you one other really gruesome example of a culinary angle to everything that we're talking about, All right? Okay, my next saint is perhaps one of the most easily recognizable of martyrs. And he of course is Saint Sebastian. And Saint Sebastian is recognizable because he's usually depicted stock full of arrows. I once had a group of students from Syracuse University and they, their challenge throughout their whole spring semester in Italy was to count the number of arrows and try to find the Saint Sebastian with the greatest number. And if I remember correctly, it wasn't this one, it was a representation of um, St. Sebastian in San Gimignano 
uh, in Tuscany. Uh, the story of St. Sebastian, I find particularly intriguing. Uh, he was a Roman Praetorian. He was Imperial Guard. This guy is like special forces in ancient Rome, but was a Christian. And Christianity was illegal. And the story goes that when the emperor discovered that one of his own guards was um, a Christian, he decided to have this guard killed by binding him to a tree and having the other Praetorians shoot him full of arrows. So it sounds like a pretty simple story. But what few people realize is that it wasn't the arrows that killed St. Sebastian. He survived this particular ordeal. He was discovered by a female saint um, who nursed him back, uh, I can't remember her name, uh, who nursed him back to health, uh, Irene, St. Irene of Rome. St. Irene finds him shot full of arrows, tied to a tree, and she nurses him back to hell. And once he recovers, instead of just kind of, you know, exiting stage left and sneaking out and getting on with his life, St. Sebastian decides to go back to the emperor and to reprimand him for what he did. And when the emperor realized that Sebastian was still alive, he figured, okay, this time I have to do it right. So they actually club St. Sebastian to within an inch of his life what's happening here. They tie him to this heavy apparatus. They then toss him into the sewer, the cloaca maxima of Rome, and that worked like a charm. Okay, so although the arrows are the identifying symbol of St. Sebastian, in reality, his method of martyrdom was being thrown into a sewer, believe it or not. So oftentimes these uh, stories have a very particular twist uh, that is unknown to the general public. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one is particular, right? St. Agatha, the Sicilian St. Agatha, who you see here in a painting in the Pitti Palace. And if you can't make it out, the objects that she's holding there on the tray are breasts, right? because it is believed that her method of martyrdom was in fact to have her breasts removed. And this is one of the more gruesome representations of the event by the Venetian painter, uh, Sebastiano del Piombo. This is located in the Pitti Palace. But just to give you an idea of what being Italian means and how the grotesque and the morbid and the almost inconceivably violent can be turned into something almost mundane, because one of the most popular desserts made in the area of Catania, Sicily, where this actually happened, was inspired by this particular type of martyrdom, and they're called mine. These are little cakes covered with icing and then the maraschino cherry on top, referring specific, and they're always served in pairs, uh, referring specifically to this method of martyrdom. So leave it to the Italians, and I am Italian, so I could say this, to transform, transform something so morbid and grotesque into something, again, uh, almost comic in their culinary sort of edge uh, of the whole story. Right. Okay, another Sicilian saint by the name of Lucia, or Saint Lucy. And you're looking at the painting and you're seeing the eyeballs and you're, really, you're waiting for a haymaker, but it's not coming. Okay? It, 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 oftentimes it is told that Saint Lucy was martyred by having her eyes gouged out, but in reality, the eyes refer to her name. Luce, light, lux, lucia. And so without light, we can't see. And so St. Lucy is actually the patron saint of eyesight, hence the eyeballs. No real gruesome story, although oftentimes uh, it is interpreted as being such. Right? Okay, this one is particularly gruesome. You see, I'm going through a row here of, of, of female saints. Uh, saint Catherine of Alexandria, patron saint of female scholars, uh, an incredibly intelligent and enlightened woman living in the fourth century uh, from Northern Africa. And she succeeded in converting the Empress, the Roman Empress to Christianity, and then embarrassed Emperor Maxentius, who you see up here, uh, when he had all of his greatest orators and scholars publicly debate with St. Catherine, and she defeated all of them. So Maxentius came up with a particularly gruesome way to kill St. Catherine, which was to have two large, spiked wheels, which would rotate rapidly in opposite directions, and then they place her in the middle and she would be shredded to pieces. Okay? So her defining symbol is the large spiked wheel or portion thereof. Because the story goes that an angel showed up, you see him up here, just in the nick of time and broke the wheels so that this method of martyrdom was in fact um, not successful. So Maxentius went back to the old fashioned, but reliable method 
of beheading, which is what you see here in Mazzolino's interpretation of the scene in Rome in the church of San Clemente, one of my favorite churches. So her identifying symbol is in fact the large spiked wheel or a portion thereof. That is St. Catherine's superpower. This painting, okay, which thanks to your generosity, uh, I, I adore this painting. This is in the Vatican Museums. It's in the Pinacoteca. And I go there, I go out of my way. I end up putting a lot of stress on myself because to go to the Pinacoteca and then try to run through the Vatican Museums is not an easy thing to do. Um, but then I also saw this in New York. This was at the Met uh, last summer. It was fab on its way to Paris because it was then part of the Paris exhibit. And again, it was through the generosity of the patrons that this painting was brought there, which I found uh, just absolutely extraordinary. I, I was like, a, like a, a proud father of a newborn to see this painting in New York. It was just such an exhilarating uh, experience. And the subject you see is Saint Jerome, right? And Jerome is one of the four doctors of the church. Uh, he is the author of the Vulgate. He translated the Greek and the Hebrew uh, Bible into Latin. And his defining attributes are the stone that you see here in his right hand with which he would pound his chest. He would mortify himself while meditating upon a cross and the lion because Jerome is one of these characters who allegedly pulled the thorn out of a lion's paw and made a friend for life. And so Jerome is another character that you see very often in Christian art. The stone, the lion are his defining attributes. Okay, let's get into more medieval saints. And to my personal favorite saint, who is St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, I maintain that Francis of Assisi is the second most uh, important revolutionary in Western history after Jesus Christ himself. Uh, and in particular, as regards to how medieval society viewed the world, but also the fact that this guy went green 700 years before going green even existed. His attitude, his relationship to nature, I just find extraordinary. In fact, uh, JP II, uh, St. John Paul II, uh, officially made Francis of Assisi the patron saint of uh, ecologists. Uh, back during his papacy, which I find absolutely appropriate. Okay, how do we know that this is Frankie, as the Franciscans like to call him? Well, A, he's wearing the Franciscan habit, the long brown robe with a length of rope around the waist, uh, and each of those knots representing a vow taken by the Franciscan order, but perhaps most importantly, the stigmata. According to tradition, Francis of Assisi received the wounds. He was stigmatized. Remember, the word exists beyond Christian uh, sphere of influence, meaning that if you are stigmatized, you are marked by something. And Francis of Assisi was marked by the wounds of Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian, your very existence is dedicated to Christ. And you can't get any closer to Jesus Christ than in sharing in the physical suffering that he endured when he was crucified. And so that is exactly what, according to tradition, happened to Francis two years before he died. The wounds in his hands, feet inside, indicate that this is Francis of Assisi, the first saint ever to allegedly have received the stigmata. Now, Francis was the founder of the Franciscan order in the 13th century, and his exact contemporary, uh, Saint Dominic, a Spanish Saint Dominic de Guzman, the founder of the Dominican order. Now, how do we know that this is Saint Dominic? The traditional Dominican habit consisted of a black cape over a white robe. In fact, from my summer camp uh, last week, uh, we were talking about Saint imagery and I actually dressed up as a Dominican. I didn't do the tonsure thing because it takes too long to grow back. If you're curious, by the way, gentlemen, if any of you want that hairstyle, T-O-N-S-U-R-E, tonsure, where you shave off essentially the top of your head. Now, how do we not confuse Dominic with any other Dominican? Well, Dominic usually holds a lily because he was particularly devout to the Virgin Mary. In fact, many believe that it was Dominic who invented the rosary. Okay? And that red star that you see associated with him, which represents the Stella Maris, the star of Mary. And so Marian imagery associated with Dominic. Now, perhaps a more famous Dominican is Thomas Aquinas.
Aquinas. Everyone knows the name, but I think few people realize that Aquinas was actually a Dominican friar. Well, how do you recognize Aquinas? Well, A, the Dominican habit. B, the golden star of illumination. He was so smart that there was a sort of glow that was associated with him. Uh, but B, also his husky stature, right? Um, supposedly Aquinas really liked his food and wine, uh, and it showed from what we're told. In fact, when he died, he was so large physically that they could not fit his dead body through the door of his cell. Uh, they had to use a, a, a lifting machine to lower that body out through the window proper. So Husky Dominican, gold star, means um, St. Thomas Aquinas. All right? Okay, and last but by no means least. I actually saved this one for the very, very end because I find him perhaps the most entertaining of all. Another Dominican martyr right, by the name of St. Peter Martyr. This one's easy to remember. He's also known as St. Peter of Verona. He was in the city of Verona, which was his hometown. Well, how do you recognize him? <laughs> I'm sorry. Just, and I've been doing this for 20 years. I still crack up every time because he's the guy with the big machete sticking out of his head. It looks like one of those novelty jokes, one of the arrows we used to wear back in the 80s. Um, according to tradition, while Peter Martyr was leaving the city of Milan, he was robbed by a couple of thieves. These thieves got a little carried away, and in their thieving, they either cleaved or clubbed or what have you, this guy to death. And so most of the time, when you see Peter Martyr, you actually see a man with a Mikhail Gorbachev-type bloodstain on his head, uh, but this artist, Lotto, went a little bit further and actually has the machete still sticking in there. Sometimes it's an axe. Uh, notice the dagger sticking into his shoulder as well. So a Dominican with any kind of killing device uh, protruding from his head uh, is, in fact, St. Peter Martyr. All right. Now, just so you know, you, know, you have all these newly acquired skills, recognizing these different saints. And again, the next time you go to the Vatican, right, join the patrons of the art in the Vatican Museums and visit the Sistine Chapel and you're looking at uh, Michelangelo's uh, majestic last judgment, this revolutionary work of art, now you can actually identify most of the characters inside. Because if you look, I'm gonna show you a couple of details. Oh, look at the guy just to the right of Jesus Christ looking up at him with these cylinders. These are actually keys, one gold and one silver, and you know it's St. Peter. Or this guy one of the most beautiful, I think, that Michelangelo ever composed with a fistful of arrows. And this, of course, is Saint Sebastian. Again, these attributes now allow you to read, interpret, and appreciate better the paintings that you look at. Saint Bartholomew, he's got the knife. He's looking particularly ticked off, by the way. And then the bodiless skin that you see hanging there uh, from his left hand. I know one of you is gonna ask me, so I'm gonna anticipate the question, do I think that that is a self-portrait of Michelangelo? Uh, the answer is, I have no idea, all right? This is one of these perfect art historical moments where someone says, oh, that's a self-portrait of Michelangelo, and it, it will be just impossible for anyone to either prove or disprove that that is Michelangelo's face. So uh, I don't have an opinion. The one thing I will tell you, if you are wondering, the hair color doesn't match, right? Michelangelo was, 61 years old when he started painting this, the uh, Last Judgment wall, and that's a full head of brown hair. Um, anyway, it's been uh, thrown out there. Or this gentleman, who of course is not holding a ladder, but holding the grid iron instead. So this is St. Lawrence. So now that you know your hagiographic iconography, or very simply your saint imagery, uh, it makes, again, your appreciation and understanding of all of this great art. Uh, even greater. All right. And with that, I'm going to finish up. And should you have any questions, I'd be more than happy uh, to answer them. All right. Well, thank you so much. I know we have a number of questions coming in. So just a reminder to go ahead and type those in that Q&A box that you see at either the top or the bottom of your screen. So the first question we have is about Fra Angelico. What was the deal with him? Was he a priest and an artist? Yes. Fra Angelico was actually a Dominican friar ordained priest at the convent of San Marco in Florence. Um, and in fact, he is technically, the Italians referred him as Beato because he was beatified by uh, St. John Paul II uh, because he lived such a pious lifestyle. But he's 
uh, one of the most extraordinary artists of the early Renaissance, so priest and painter at the same time. Great, we've got another question about non-Italian imagery. So a lot, of the, a lot of the images that we've looked at today are obviously from Italy, from mm -hmm. you know, the Middle Ages of the Renaissance. Do these same iconographic styles show up all over Western Europe through the Byzantine Empire? How common are they? Yeah, the, put it this way, the symbolism or the iconography for the A-class saints remains consistent throughout. The styles change, of course, whether it's Flemish or whether it's uh, Northern European. Um, but what often happens, and it, not just between different European countries, but oftentimes between different Italian cities, is that the, the saints themselves change. So, for instance, when you go to Venice and you see St. Theodore, or uh, Santa Giustina. You know, these are saints who are not very popular in southern, in, in central and southern Italy. Uh, and the same holds true then, for instance, my wife is French. So their saint calendar, you know, if I look today's the feast day of so-and-so, and she says, no, it's not, it's the feast day of so-and-so. So it's interesting how that, I mean, they're obviously each day has a group of saints, but depending on what country it is, they have a tendency to emphasize or to celebrate other saints more. But those top level saints, the John the Baptist, the apostles, Mary Magdalene, what have you, the imagery and the iconography does remain consistent across uh, Europe and the Byzantine Empire for that fact as well. Speaking of John the Baptist, um, one of our guests wants to know, why does the Eastern Church portray St. John the Baptist with wings? Oh, that I do not know the answer to, to be perfectly honest. I've never seen John the Baptist with wings. Um, I don't know. I, I'm gonna have to pass on that, and, and you stumped me on that. So thank you. But I, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Do you, Katie, by any chance? I, know you I know don't. People. I don't. No, I know a lot of times you'll see John the Evangelist with wings because they'll sort of do a, the eagle. a man eagle hybrid. <laughs> and so sometimes I think if it says like Sancta Johannes, it gets misidentified as John the Baptist. But I haven't seen. Um, I, if there's a specific uh, work of art that you're thinking of, question ask, or we'd love to know because we can absolutely, yeah, you can pass it, it yeah. on to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely love to see that. Yeah. Um, okay. So, a question about another one of our A-list saints that we saw today. Can you talk about the meaning of the phrase "doubting Thomas"? Is this to do with St. Mm -hmm. Thomas? Yeah, exactly. So, the doubting Thomas, because remember, Thomas refused to believe that Jesus was alive again until he had the the, the necessary proof. And so he said, look, when I can stick my fingers into Jesus's wounds, then I'll believe that he's alive. Um, and so the idea that if you are a person who is skeptical by nature, like the apostle Thomas was, then you are referred to as a doubting Thomas. That's where it comes from. One interesting note on the, um, on the sculpture that I showed you, the uh, Verrocchio version of the doubting Thomas, that is actually the statue that represents the mercantile court guild. Uh, in Florence in the 15th century, which I find absolutely extraordinary because the, the saint that they choose to be their patron saint, the mercantile court guild, is the guy who needed proof. And so obviously this kind of commercial tribune saying, look, you can't just come here and shout louder than the guy next to you. We want evidence, just like Thomas wanted evidence. And so obviously there are deeper, more underlying meanings to these saints as well. Is there, um, when we're working on our saint identification, is there an easy way to differentiate the Marys? So can you tell Mary Magdalene from the Blessed Virgin Mary in paintings easily? Um, I, yes, I believe the Virgin Mary also has, there's actually a, a, an adjective there. She is Marian, and I use that very often when I'm looking, for instance, at Botticelli's Primavera painting, where Venus looks very much like the Virgin Mary. She is Marian in appearance, and so, uh, the Virgin Mary is so consistently regular in the way she is represented. Um, you know, the red and the blue, not too old, not too young, quite beautiful, maternal, um, that I think it's nearly impossible to confuse her with uh, Mary Magdalene. And Mary Magdalene, again, usually appearing in art, um, and she's just, she just stands out as the most physically attractive. She usually has long strawberry blonde hair, um, somewhat ostentatious dress, uh, beautiful, but at the same time drawing attention to her. And so the idea of almost emphasizing her appealing physical attributes. So I think it's difficult and it would be difficult to confuse the two of them. Um, but again, you know, a lot of this simply comes down to 
how much time you spend looking at this stuff. And I joke about this with my students all the time because, you know, when we, first thing we do, we walk into a museum or a church and we look at a work of art. The first question that comes out of my mouth, before I tell them anything, I don't tell them what the work of art is. I ask subject and they need to tell me. And, you know, my joke always is that by about a month into our semester, my undergraduate, undergraduates are like a well-oiled art history machine in identifying subject matter. You know, most of that has to do with my extraordinary teaching ability. No, I'm just kidding. Most of that has to do with the fact that it's always the same darn thing we're looking at. It, you know, again, there's a very limited amount of subject matter, most of which is coming out of the Bible. So it's those same stories, those same characters being represented over and over again. And you know, a question I get very often about this is, wasn't it tedious for medieval and Renaissance audiences to just see the same subject matter over and over again? And the answer that I give is that, look, a few hundred years from now, when you know, a futuristic society looks back on the beginning of the 21st century, they're going to ask the same thing about us. Because if you haven't noticed, just about every other movie that is being produced right now is in fact a superhero movie. That's pretty much all we make. And so the idea that you know, it's not that different from what was actually happening back then, because that is what the market demands, and that's what viewers actually wanted to see. Mm -hmm. We have a question about sort of viewer response. So um, one of our attendees wants to know, what were people supposed to feel, right? These, these gruesome deaths, are they supposed to evoke empathy or tenderness? Because they're, they're pretty intense and they kind of make you cringe when you look at some of them. I think, you know, if you think, and again, I focus ex almost exclusively with the exception of Ribera on Italian art, but the Spanish are even more it's severe. A, it's yeah, intense. exactly. You yeah. know, I mean, when they start doing the Christus Mortus and the Passion um, parades, and and again, I've left out the flagellants and the self mortification, and um, you know, there is that inherent uh, drama. I mean, it's it's that sense of yeah, look, these these saints have given us this themselves, physically, spiritually, they've given themselves to God, and they are examples, but. It's, it's part of that Catholic, oh, I don't know, I don't know what you call it, je ne sais pas. I mean, it's, it's part of that whole kind of Catholic identity that there is this dramatic personae who've, who've acted out this, this tragedy and died, ultimately to be rewarded in heaven. I don't necessarily, I think that these saints are meant to be larger than life. Uh, again, like superheroes are, and they, you know, they bring people back from the dead. They themselves come back from the dead. Uh, they go through extraordinary ordeals. Uh, they're able to put up with um, enormous sacrifice. And so the idea that they become, and I know a bit of a almost sadistic or masochistic way, um, role models, right, to that medieval Christian. And it does, it is meant in a certain way to kind of belittle you, because why should you be crying about this and whining about that when poor St. Catherine had giant spiked wheels or St. Sebastian was shot full of arrows? Uh, and so in a way, I think they, we elevate them to the status as sort of spiritual role models uh, to help us endure. And again, mm -hmm. society at that time was going through much harder reality than what we're going through today. We've gotten several questions on this, and I think it's a, it's a popular one to ask, which is what uh, additional resources are out there to help us study and develop this visual literacy, especially in religious art? How can we, how can we get better at our, our hagiographic iconography? <sighs> You, you look, you look, you look. It's like music. Um, it's like anything else. You just, the more you're exposed to it. You know, my thing, having lived in Italy for 20 years and pretty much begun my professional career when I got there in 96, I was an art history major um, as an undergraduate, but I was looking more at modern art than I was Renaissance. Um, you know, in the Vatican museums, I go through three, four times a week, the Uffizi. But it was interesting when I moved back to the United States five years ago and I'm in the Met, I'm in the MFA, I'm in the Getty Center, um, I'm at the National Gallery in, in Washington, and I'm seeing the same art that I saw there, but I'm seeing it with people who maybe are not that familiar with these museums. And I, I honestly find that I'm spending most of my time, I don't get to the actual, oh, explaining the art itself, because we spend most of our time simply trying to get people to enter through. And that was really my stimulus behind all of this, because when I look at you know, a 14th century painting of St. Stephen with the rocks attached to his head, I try to put myself into the position of a 20-year-old um, American university student saying, what do they see when they see that? You know, there's this wall 
uh, between them and, and the work of art that they need to kind of cross through. So I think that if we can demystify it first and foremost, you know, we go to the Metropolitan Museum in New York and there's that Ducho painting that's 12 inches tall that they paid $37.5 million for. Um, you know, we get into that first. So why would you pay $40 million for something that big? Demystify it first and make it human. Make or remind people of the fact that there are human beings who are depicting these saints and those human beings like the, you know, flowering rod of Joseph or the arrows, you know, Again, the denominator through all of it, from all the way back to those guys drawing on cave walls, all the way up to, you know, Banksy, is humanity. We're the ones who produce all this stuff. And we don't really change, doesn't matter how much time goes by. It's just what we produce that changes, you follow? But ultimately, it's that human character. So you keep looking, keep looking, keep researching, keep watching, reading, et cetera, et cetera. And I think what happens is that you start to connect the dots between different eras, different styles, different countries. Uh, in different periods in art. So I think we've got time for one last question. And sure. again, it's one that we've gotten a couple times, which is, can you talk a little bit more about the golden legend? Where does it come from? Who puts it together? And, and how are, are artists influenced by it? Yeah, so the golden legend, again, it's a mid, it's published in 1265. The author was Jacopo de Voragini. He was an Italian author. And essentially it is, the codification of what were then widely circulating in popular legends concerning different saints. Um, and oftentimes there are kind of conflicting versions there as well, because, oh, there's they supposedly St. Christopher did this, but supposedly these guys say he did that as well. Uh, and once it's written down, it really becomes, I'm not gonna use the word canon, it's not canon, but it does become the sort of source of iconography for just about every um, artist at the time. And, you know, the church never really went out of its way to undermine it, you know, its authority or what have you. And they kind of accepted it and just increased the general uh, popularity. And so, for instance, if any of you, you know, the whole Dan Brown craze that went on years ago uh, concerning Mary Magdalene, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that was based on a 13th century book of legend. Um, and in fact, actually, his book was based on another fiction, fictional book that was based on the 13th century uh, oral tradition or what have you as well. And there's no real historical basis to it. Uh, but again, it was just a place where everyone could go to find out the stories of these celebrities, these superheroes um, that they saw appear and talked about uh, over and over and over again in the art uh, that they um, enjoyed at the time. Okay. Well, I think that's about all the time that we have for today. So thank you so much, Rocky. And oh, you thank you. Yeah. Thank you to our sponsors, um, of course, from the California and Northwest chapter. And thank you so much to all the patrons and guests who joined us today, um, especially any of you who are joining us for the first time. I hope you'll join us next week when our seven part lecture series will continue at the same time for the third lecture in our series, Renaissance Pleasure Palaces, and we'll take an insider's look at some of the lavish villas built by Renaissance Italians, including two of the best preserved in Rome, uh, the Villa Farnesina and the Villa Borghese. And both of them are absolutely stunning, so you don't want to miss that. From all of us at the patrons, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your support. If you are not a member, please consider becoming part of our community and certainly follow us online to stay up to date with the latest in art and conservation news. We appreciate all of you being with us today, and we'll see you next time. See you next week, everyone.